Tonight, we look at the frightening experiences of ordinary people whose lives were turned upside down by their beliefs. Sam Domingo spent 20 years in a group she thought would save the world, the Church of Scientology. There was going to be no more criminality, no more drugs, no more sadness. Everybody was going to be happy. Instead, she claimed she endured harsh punishments. It was freezing cold. It was January, and I was given a pickaxe and told to go dig a hole. For Karen Stanway, the Jehovah's Witnesses turned her life inside out. She lived in constant fear of Armageddon. Earthquakes, famine, any time you saw anything on the news or anything like that, you always got very anxious and thinking, you know, is Armageddon going to come tomorrow? And fellow Jehovah's Witness Karen Morgan found herself feeling powerless in the face of abuse. I remember being sat on the floor between my mum and dad, crying my eyes out, not really saying anything. We'll hear the extraordinary stories of three women who found themselves wrapped up in powerful religious movements and ended up believing that they were trapped in cults. We were financially ruined, and my marriage was ruined, and my family was ruined. Sam Domingo spent nearly half her life in the Church of Scientology. She joined in hope and found much that was positive, but she left in anger. She believes she was coerced into having an abortion, and she says she and her husband were persuaded to hand over hundreds of thousands of pounds. Scientologists will consider that Scientology is more important than their lives, it's more important than their families, it's more important than having a roof over their head. It's more important than food. It's more important than everything. And that's always a dangerous thing. In the late 1980s, 20-year-old Sam dropped out of college and spent a year partying in Amsterdam. Then she met a good-looking young man with strong beliefs. Sam fell into Scientology the day she fell in love. It was my first love and I was young. He seemed to have all these, the answers to all these questions. And he was so certain that he had all the answers, he knew, and Scientology would explain everything. Sam dived into Scientology's teachings, and within months, she moved with her boyfriend to the UK headquarters, St Hill Manor, in East Grinstead. I honestly thought we were going to make everybody sane and there was going to be no more criminality, no more drugs, no more sadness, everybody was going to be happy. And my parents told me it was a cult, but I didn't believe my parents because parents don't know anything. Scientology's been around since the 1950s. It was created by the American science fiction writer L. Ron Hubbard, and it's famous for attracting A-list stars like Tom Cruise and John Travolta. In 2013, the UK Supreme Court ruled Scientology was a religion, but the church has been dogged by accusations of cult-like and manipulative behavior, allegations it has consistently denied. That's St. Hill Manor, and then to the left, dwarfed, is the castle, is the wee little castle. It is a beautiful place. At St. Hill in the late 1980s, Sam joined Scientology's most devout followers. She remembers she was immediately immersed in a strict regime. You know, you are instantly cut off from the outside world. You know, you have no TV, you have no phone. Your calls are monitored, your communication with your family is monitored. Every time you have a question, you get an answer from them, their answer. And after a while, you're only getting their answers and your reality changes completely. Living in communal digs down the road, Sam spent as much as 15 hours a day at St. Hill. There, she was required to go through a process known as auditing, which is meant to rid followers of spiritual disabilities. Believers are wired up to a special electronic meter and asked detailed questions about their lives. Sam remembers it was an emotional roller coaster. You really do go from this euphoric, I'm out of my body, I'm, this is amazing, I can do anything, and then the next minute you, you're sort of, um, well, you know, I'm not really 
not really getting this and it's because I'm probably because I'm a bad person I'm not very ethical and I don't deserve to it goes like that the strict regime Sam encountered at St. Hill was because she had chosen to join Scientology's small number of most dedicated members in a group known as the Sea Organization. According to Scientology, the Sea Organization is a religious order, similar to monks. Membership is voluntary, and its disciplined life is only for the most devoted Scientologists. The Scientology website explains that Sea Org members sign a billion-year pledge to signify eternal commitment. At Scientology's UK headquarters in the early 1990s, Sam was working long hours and said she had to endure unpleasant conditions. Even food was used as a punishment. We washed our clothes in the bathtub, but the living conditions were terrible. I mean, rice and beans were supposed to be a punishment because we weren't working hard enough. Not getting paid was a punishment because we weren't working hard enough. Beans and rice then became dry porridge and milk powder mixed with water sleeping on dirty old mattresses in crowded rooms. I don't know what I was thinking, except if we weren't so lazy and undeserving, we could, you know, everybody could, we could save the world and eat proper food. Scientology sent us these photos of facilities around St. Hill Manor today. They reject Sam's claims as untrue and say they bear no relation to current conditions. They also say that Sea Organization members are not cut off or monitored, that they have phones and computers and enjoy a varied menu. Although Sam thought the conditions were harsh, she remained a committed follower. People don't understand why people don't just leave, and there are many reasons for that. You've gotten involved, you've invested yourself. Your mind has been made to believe that this group is has the truth and is the best place for you to be. Yeah, that's a good question. Why don't you walk away? You can't. You know, you've joined this group and you've made this promise and you've signed a billion year contract and you kind of feel like you're betraying everybody else, basically. Karen Stanway spent more than half her life dedicating herself to a different religious group. It's been about 10, 12 years since I was last here. I was born into this congregation, so for 16 years I had to come here three times a week without fail. Karen was born into the Jehovah's Witnesses. Her life once revolved around the Kingdom Hall in Guildford. Bring, bringing it all back. It just makes you feel so angry because you felt so safe here and this was such a familiar place. And now I can pinpoint this place to meaning that I haven't got a career and I haven't got any money and, you know, which if I, if I hadn't been brought up to his witness, I probably would do. And I wouldn't be so, quite so messed up, probably. <laughs> Over 130,000 people are Jehovah's Witnesses in the UK. To many people, they're a recognised offshoot of Christianity. They also have charitable status. But critics say that the church resembles a cult in the way it controls its members and isolates people who step out of line. Mark Latham used to belong, but is now a critic and helps support others who leave. They come to your door with a smile and with a suit on while they're holding their children's hands. But there are things within this religion that are dangerous and the undue influence that can occur on you can happen many years after you've left. Karen Stanway says the Witnesses' teachings keep young members isolated from the rest of society. You're very much closed in to this society because you're discouraged from being friends with people who aren't Jehovah's Witnesses. Obviously it's difficult at school, you know, it's hard not to make friends at school, but then you'd have to explain why you couldn't go out with your friends, you couldn't go around their house, you couldn't stay at their house. You're not, weren't allowed to go on school trips that were overnight, anything like that. She says the group's teachings and literature, including its publication, The Watchtower, made her fearful of outsiders. 
We were taught that people who weren't Jehovah's Witnesses were evil and that they were controlled by Satan. When you're at school, when you're at work, when you're talking to anybody, you're always thinking, well, Satan is controlling this person. I must keep away from them. I mustn't get involved with them. And there was the constant fear, reinforced through the use of extreme imagery in the watchtower, that Armageddon is close. There used to be very scary pictures of what Armageddon was going to look like, people getting killed, um, being burnt, anything like earthquakes, famine, that are all in the Bible as being a sign that Armageddon is going to come. So anytime you saw anything on the news or anything like that, you always got very anxious and thinking, you know, is Armageddon going to come tomorrow and am I a good enough person? You know, have I done enough in the religion to be one of the chosen ones to be saved? The threat of Armageddon can be quite traumatic and it's the constancy of that threat and the real belief that unless you follow the teachings that you will be condemned like everyone else to burn in the fires of hell when Armageddon comes. For Karen though, it would be traumatic events much closer to home which would push her away from the religion and the only community she'd ever known. I remember that moment in that meeting and I it was the only time I've ever done anything out of anger. I just got up and stormed out and slammed the door. By 1994, Sam Domingo had spent five years as a Scientologist in the elite sea organization. Most of her time was spent at St. Hill Manor, the British headquarters. She says she had to cope with communal living and long periods of separation from her family. I would beg for time off. Can I go home? Can I go see my mother? No. You can't be replaced. Your work is too important. One Christmas, she rebelled and ran away to spend time with her mum. My mum had been saying, come home for Christmas. So I ran away. I actually hitchhiked from East Grinstead to Derby. Spent Christmas and then called the organisation full of blame, shame and regret. Sam says she was punished for rebelling with harsh outdoor work in freezing weather. And then, unexpectedly, the organization told her it needed her to work in California as a supervisor at its celebrity center. I was trained to supervise the courses. I mean, a Scientology supervisor doesn't really do anything other than make sure people are reading their Scientology materials, because nothing can be altered. Yet. Everything L. Ron Hubbard wrote has to come in its pure form from L. Ron Hubbard. Sam was a long way from home, but at least her living conditions improved. Celebrity Centre, you're in front of the public, so we had nice clothes and, and we, we got fed, which was really good. So for me, that was a big step up. And the uniforms got washed. We didn't have to wash the uniforms in bathtubs with soap because it probably wouldn't look good to the celebrities. <laughs> By now, Sam was no longer with the boyfriend who first introduced her to the Church of Scientology. But she was about to find out just how much the organization liked to say in the relationships of its elite members. Sam had a growing friendship with one of her colleagues, and this soon drew the attention of their leaders. I had gone off to Celebrity Center and started flirting with um, a guy that worked there. And, you know, within a, within a few weeks, it was, you know, it had already become an ethics matter. Get, you guys need to get married. It's going too far. You know, you're holding hands. You need to get married. To Professor Rod Dubrow Marshall, it's behavior like this which makes Scientology seem less like a religion and more like a cult. Groups will often say to individuals who you can sleep with, whether you can have a child or not. There are even examples of where they've uh, made people have abortions. And, and this is just a way of completely controlling the individual and basically saying to the person, we own you. So we got married um, and I was on the pill and woohoo, they found out I'm pregnant. As Sam was in the most dedicated part of Scientology, the Sea Organization, that meant that her happy news was bad news. Sea Organization members are not permitted to have young children. If a female member becomes pregnant, she and her husband are required to leave Sea Org to have the baby. It was officially an ethics matter. 
So I went to the ethics office and I said, hey, look, I've gotten pregnant. Bang! Just like I had committed the ultimate sin. And the next thing that came was, so what's the greatest good for the greatest number of dynamics here? Like, are you asking me to have an abortion? Well, what's the greatest good? You know, it was, yes, basically, yes, the right thing to do is have an abortion. That was made very, very clear to me. And when I said, absolutely not, you know, I'm going to talk to my husband about this. I mean, because that is your first line of support, your husband. No, I wasn't allowed to talk to him. Sam says she didn't see her husband until later that day. I didn't see him till like maybe 10 o'clock at night and he came home and he said, I know what you did. You did this deliberately to get me my own husband. You, I can't believe you were so evil. You, basically, you're on your own, you know, you've committed this awful sin and you're on your own. So that's what happened when I got pregnant. Isolated and alone, the pressure on Sam was intense. Everybody I looked up to and respected told me he was a criminal. The head of the organization told my husband I was a leech. Yeah, I believed it. I bought into it. I had the abortion to prove I was a good person and I wasn't this evil Satan that everybody was saying I was. Scientology told us that although abortion is against the teachings of L. Ron Hubbard, members can choose to have an abortion. If they do choose to have a baby, they must leave Sea Org, and many have done so. They can rejoin it when the child is older, and some do. For Sam, the pressure she felt to abort her baby has left a permanent scar. I murdered a child. That's the way I look at it, and it will forever live with me that I murdered a child. And that's the way I see it. And I will never forgive myself for that, and I will never be able to write it. But despite the trauma, it would take Sam nearly 15 years before she could finally bring herself to walk away from Scientology. Karen Stanway found it just as hard to part company with her childhood religion, the Jehovah's Witnesses. The catalyst was her home life. Home life was, wasn't great because my father, he would be one person walking into the Kingdom Hall and the other brothers and sisters thought he was this wonderful man and then he'd come home and be a nightmare to live with. The stress took its toll on Karen. I was diagnosed with severe depression when I was 17. Um, I was also diagnosed with anorexia. The doctors and therapists I saw all said that there was a link between that and the way I felt in the religion about sort of having no control over anything, feeling frustrated, not being able to change anything. Things got even worse for Karen and her mum when, following the usual practice, they turned to the elders of their church for help with Karen's dad's behaviour. I know my mum was feeling suicidal at the point where she called the meeting with the elders. It was breaking point for her. She couldn't go on sort of pretending, living this life anymore. And I really think she thought the elders would help her. But the meeting offered no solution to the family's problems. They wanted to talk to us all together, which was difficult enough, obviously having to tell them what my dad was like in front of my dad. Mark Latham is a former witness who now counsels others who leave. He says that few Jehovah's Witness elders have had proper training and often aren't up to the job. With most elders, they're not trained in the arts of counseling. And you'll have three men come round. One might be a window cleaner. Another one might be working in an office. Another one could be a milkman. And there they are, sat there, and they're going to counsel you on what could be a very intricate, complicated issue for you. All that came out of the meeting was me and my mum being reproved for not being a good enough wife, for not being a good enough daughter. Unable to deal with it, Karen left. And I remember that moment in that meeting, and I, it was the only time I've ever done anything out of anger. I just got up and stormed out and slammed the door. For Karen, this was a turning point. 
when she realized that Jehovah's Witnesses would not protect her or her mother. But she knew that people who stopped following Jehovah's Witness rules risked total banishment and being cut off from family and friends. Within each Jehovah's Witness congregation, the elders' rule is often absolute, and critics accuse them in some cases of refusing to allow criminal acts to be investigated by outsiders, even the police. It's claimed members who oppose this can be banished from all contact with friends and family. It could be a sexual issue, it could be anything. You, could be, you might be suffering from some form of clinical depression and you need real medical assistance and help and guidance to get you through it. But these elders, when they arrive, will not have those qualifications to do it. But what they do have is an absolute rock-solid control over you, and they will get what they want. Karen Morgan from South Wales knows this only too well. Between the ages of 12 and 14, she was subject to sexual abuse from her uncle, Mark Sewell, a well-respected church elder who held a position of power and trust within the group. He started to become over-familiar at the beginning, um, suggestive, get, trying to get me to kiss him on the mouth. That's how it began. And it's from then that life started to change for me. Karen initially had no idea her uncle's behavior was inappropriate. I think Jehovah's Witness children in general are very innocent. We never hear about dangers and, and we were taught you can trust Jehovah's Witnesses. You don't trust anyone else, but you can trust them. And especially people who are of a good standing in the congregation, like a ministerial servant or an elder. But when her uncle's behavior got worse, Karen realized something was wrong. He'd start calling me from his bedroom, but if I didn't answer him, he would then come into my bed wearing just his pants. Finally, Karen told her parents, who as devout Jehovah's Witnesses got her to write it all down and put it to her uncle. And my mum and dad said, right, following the Bible, there's a scripture in the Bible which says, if you have a problem with your brother, you must first go and lay bare that problem with your brother. So, how it's done is, my dad handed Mark what I had written. Mark read it, laughed, and then sort of threw it at my dad, and just said, no, she's, she's confused, she's made it up, she's telling lies. I remember being sat on the floor between my mum and dad, crying my eyes out, not really saying anything. And that was pretty much left like that. Karen was told not to talk to anyone about what had happened and Sewell carried on his behavior with her. She would later find out he was doing the same thing to other women in the community. It was two more years before further allegations came to light. Nine women came forward, some alleging they'd been raped. But still the elders didn't report the case to the authorities. If it was me and my children, the first time my daughter ever told me anything like that, I'd be straight on the phone to the police. I wouldn't be considering, oh, well, I'm going to have to run this by the elders. According to former Jehovah's Witness Mark Latham, Karen's story is not an isolated one. Karen's case is very typical of many of the cases that are out there, simply because the elder arrangement uh, manipulates events or can manipulate events through secrecy. And there are occasions where the uh, molester or the rapist is an elder themselves. And so they can conduct themselves within the secrecy of their own elder group to influence matters on another level, to make sure that they protect themselves. To some observers, it's the very secretive nature of the organization that prevents any independent approach to cases of abuse and gives it traits like a cult. The Court of Elders in the Jehovah's Witnesses is a good example of when uh, groups stand in judgment of their members and don't allow anyone else uh, to have a say and don't allow themselves to be open to public scrutiny. And in that way, the leaders perpetuate uh, the practices and don't allow their members to effectively challenge that. Eventually, Karen defied the elders and with some of Mark Sewell's other victims, went to the police. 
It took until 2014 before Sewell was finally found guilty of eight historic sex offences and sentenced to 14 years. I would describe him as sadistic, um, controlling, selfish. He loved the fact he was an elder. He loved the power that came with being an elder. It was all about power and, you know, manipulation. Following Mark Sewell's conviction, the Jehovah's Witnesses released a statement saying all sex offences were repugnant to them and that anybody committing child abuse would be expelled. They said there was no pressure on families not to report to the police, and they recognised that crime is a matter for secular authorities. By 1995, Sam Domingo's marriage to a fellow Scientologist had collapsed after she felt obliged to abort their baby. Despite her experience with the abortion, Sam stayed in the Sea Organization, and later she even agreed to sign up for the Scientology Rehabilitation Project Force. As an idea, is like you're a damaged piece, you're not doing well, you're gonna go off here and you're gonna get some spiritual counseling and um, everybody who's there is gonna work together and then you're gonna come back when you're all fixed. Um, it's supposed to be like two, three months. According to Scientology, the Rehabilitation Project Force is a voluntary program of spiritual rehabilitation. Its purpose is to provide a second chance to those who have failed to fulfill their ecclesiastical responsibilities as members of the Sea Organization. Sam says she made friends there and had some good times, but ultimately she found it a harsh place. They, to, to me, there's a prison camp. You put on there, you're not allowed to communicate with everybody, anybody else outside of this group. You have to call everybody sir. You're the lowest of the low. Um, you wear black boiler suits, you have to run everywhere. Um, you have to receive, I think it's five hours of counseling a day. And I wasn't allowed to use the phone. I didn't have a phone, I wasn't allowed to use a public phone. We were sent on little backboards with wheels underneath the kitchens and scraped grease amongst cockroaches and silverfish and rats. That was what I, I experienced. Other people had to climb inside skips and clean them with toothbrushes. But something kept Sam going. Before starting the rehabilitation project force, she caught the eye of a recent high-profile recruit to Scientology. Placido Domingo Jr., the son of the legendary opera singer. And he was determined to get her out of her harsh rehab. I'd met Placido, but I'd agreed that I was very bad and I wouldn't be with him, but he wasn't accepting of that. He was basically dropping threats. You know, if you don't let her out, I'm gonna get a chopper in there, I'm gonna come and bust her out. So that, that's the point where they let me go, when they were under that much pressure, like, you know, literally, let her go or I'm gonna send a helicopter. That worked. When Sam left rehab, she married Placido. They left the Sea Organization and started a family. But Sam still couldn't totally walk away. She believed it was her and not Scientology, which was the problem. I messed up, I'm bad because Scientology's good and Scientology has the only solution for mankind and I need to protect that and nourish it and if I fail because I'm being selfish because I want certain things in life, that is my failing and you know, who am I to want to have kids and marriage and a happy life? Although they no longer worked for Scientology, Sam and Placido Jr. felt they could still gain spiritual enlightenment. So they decided to sign up for more courses and counselling. But Sam claims once she stopped working for Scientology, she started to have to pay for its services. And she claims she also got a bill for all courses and counselling she'd previously received. This is known as a freeloader bill. So I had three kids and I, you know, I um, did my amends for leaving the Sea Organization and I said I'm really, really sorry and paid them lots of money and I paid my freeloader free debt for all the amazing things I'd received as a staff member, $50,000. And then, um, you know, it was $10,000 for an intensive of this and $10,000 for a repair and $10,000 for this course. 
Over the next 10 years, Sam estimates she and her wealthy husband paid Scientology £200,000 for courses, as well as tens of thousands more in donations. More money, more money, next course. Get you through the course as fast as you can. Buy the next one. It's all very urgent. You have to do it now. And it's very vital that you go to the registrar and you hand your credit card. And if you don't have the money, find it, borrow it, take a loan. That makes it even harder to turn back when you've invested so much. Scientology denies Sam's claims and says people are not pressured to take out loans, use credit cards, or make other payments. They say there is no compulsion to buy courses or literature or pay for its services. By 2009, the cost had put a strain on her finances and her marriage was falling apart. Sam Domingo finally began to question her involvement with Scientology. We were financially ruined and my marriage was ruined and my family was ruined and I went, this is not working out too well. She turned to the internet and websites she'd previously been forbidden to look at. Sam was overwhelmed by the story she read of people who said their lives were ruined by Scientology. All of a sudden, everything made sense. And I was out, just like that, just because I disobeyed the rule about not going on the internet. Sam now made the decision to leave, but actually breaking ties with Scientology would prove harder than she imagined. You create a prison in your own mind, like your mind becomes the prison. There's, no, there's nobody stopping you walking out. But your mind, you become your own prison guard. Rod Duber and Marshall has come across many people who say they felt trapped, like Sam. It's only after a period of time when you've had the chance to doubt and think about what you're doing uh, that, and it's like a pressure cooker, it builds up slowly over time, sometimes over many years before people then have the courage to leave and leave what they've devoted themselves to. As soon as Sam told the Church of Scientology she was leaving, she was declared a non-person or a suppressive. If you're declared a suppressive person, you are basically excommunicated from the church, denied all rights and privileges, which include the rights and privileges of having friends or having a family uh, or having a job. Um, so anything that you had in your life that was connected to Scientology is gone. Her marriage was already over. Now Sam's life began to fall apart, as she says she was shunned by her fellow Scientologists, people she used to consider friends. For two years it was hell. It was hell. And I was barely keeping it together, and I was only keeping it together for the kids. There was one point I felt suicidal, because I'd lost everything. I'd lost my friends, I'd lost my marriage, you know, um, utter mess. and. The kids were in a state, and I felt responsible. Slowly, she started to rebuild her life. The point I decided to fight back was where the kids got targeted. Yeah, my seven-year-old was excommunicated because I was excommunicated, and um, her friends disconnected from her, and nobody in Scientology would have anything to do with it. The Church of Scientology has said Sam is disingenuous to complain if she was shunned, since it was she who publicly announced her disconnection from the church and made abusive statements about it. According to Professor Rod Dubrow Marshall, it can be difficult to go back to everyday life after leaving a group like this. Re-entering society is very hard because there's a huge gap in your life that you don't want to explain to people. You've not had a career, your CV is kind of empty, uh, you have no money, you have no friends, you have to remake your relationship with your family. And it's a whole process of rebuilding, really from the ground up. And for Sam, there was the added responsibility of three children to care for. It was going to be a slow and painful journey back. Karen Stanway and Karen Morgan were both Jehovah's Witnesses who felt the religion failed them when they suffered family crisis, and in Karen Morgan's case, sexual abuse. They were born into the organization, and they knew if they left, it would try to disfellowship them, isolate them from everyone they'd known. They've known nothing but the cultic experience, where relationships are very, very tightly controlled, They've been very isolated from society, and their voices haven't been much heard. Myself and my boyfriend, who was 
uh, Che was witness at the time. He wanted to leave, I wanted to leave but we had to try and find a way of doing it so that we wouldn't get disfellowshipped and lose contact with our families. Critics claim trying to break away from the Jehovah's Witnesses can be tough and the social pressure immense. They have this one tool, this one weapon of shunning and they dress it up, misapply scriptures and then get their policemen, the elders, to police it. And when that shunning happens, it's very real. Our solution was to get married, move away, so we could leave the religion but not get disfellowshipped. Karen Morgan's exit was a different kind of pain. She decided to walk away after the elders ignored her claims of sexual abuse at the hands of her uncle. It caused turmoil in her family. I can remember having arguments with my mum, terrible, about things. Um, and. I can remember my mum saying, well, if you're not going to come to meetings anymore, you're not living here anymore. So I was sort of like, well, fine, I'll move out, as teenagers do. And I literally did. I packed a suitcase and I moved out of their house. Didn't have a clue where I was going. Karen was disfellowshipped by the group. I was on my own, living in a horrible little bed sit, didn't know a soul, um, and had no contact with my mum and dad for a year. She was faced with dealing with the world outside the Jehovah's Witnesses for the first time. They're going to feel like pariahs and very stigmatized. How do you, at what point do you say to somebody, well, I grew up in this crazy group? Um, you know, when is that okay to disclose to somebody? It's a very scary thing. I'm very lucky I didn't end up dead, raped, um, addicted to drugs, alcohol, anything. I could have ended up anywhere and I'm very lucky I didn't but so many people do. When I left the organisation I found it very very difficult because I was suddenly sort of thrown out on my own. Um, I hadn't even sort of lived a teenage life either so I was in my twenties and felt like I had to start a whole new life all over again. The social isolation and loss of trust was a big issue for Karen Stanway. I found it very difficult to make new friends. You know, my close friends that I'd grown up with and that I'd always known had cut me off in a heartbeat. So I thought, well, why should I bother trying to make friends and trust people when that could happen all over again? It's also the families that can suffer when shunning takes place. Karen Morgan was lucky. Her family ties have proved stronger than the Jehovah's. The turning point came when I was getting married and, of course, uh, wanted my dad to walk me down the aisle. Two elders went to see him and basically gave him a choice. If you walk your daughter down the aisle, you won't be an elder anymore. And it was as simple as that. Something clicked in my dad's head emotionally and he became completely numb overnight to the Jehovah's Witnesses. And he said he just thought, do you know what? I'm walking my daughter down the aisle and, and that's it. My dad picked me over, over the Jehovah's Witnesses. After seven years, Karen Stanway is also reconciled with her mother. I have a very good relationship with my mum. She doesn't go to meetings anymore. I mean, I think the pressure got to her as well. We are very close now. Now she has a new partner and a daughter, and she's trying to rebuild her life. Oh, she is my life. She's all I concentrate on. She's all I do everything for. I'm never going to tell her what to do with her life. I'm always going to give her as many options as possible. But the pain of her former life is always present. I feel a lot of resentment, a lot of anger as well, that those opportunities were taken away from me and that I feel like I've wasted the first 16, 17 years of my life. Now Karen Stanway has a job and a future. I mean, I love this job. I love working with the animals. 
I'm hoping to become a qualified veterinary nurse. Um, that's something I feel I can concentrate on now. Um, and obviously I've got my daughter, you know, I'm going to see her grow up. I think I've just discovered life, really. There's so many possibilities, um, not just career-wise, but, you know, just how you live your life. Um, it's just having the freedom of choice. I can feel I could, can be me now. Five years after she left the Church of Scientology, Sam Domingo has finally started to rebuild her life back in the UK. The kids had lost everything, including their pets, when we moved out here and we ran away and the marriage ended and everything. And I, I got the ferrets because the ferrets used to make the kids laugh. I thought it was time to bring laughter back into the house, so we went out to the shelter and we got three ferrets and sure enough, within three days there were squeals of laughter in the house again. It was two years of hell and now it's, now we're, we're all flourishing and doing really well. The kids have jobs, they're doing well at school, they're happy. I'm happy, you know, have a normal life. Scientology was a key part of Sam's life and she accepts not all of her experiences were negative. But Sam now has a mission to stop them recruiting new members. My experience in Scientology, what did it do to me? It made me a stronger person. It made me a wiser person and it made me, it gave me the ammunition to fight back. Sam may no longer be inside the church, but she remains a rebel, returning to Scientology's UK HQ in East Grinstead. We fight back by exposing the abuses, telling people what really happens so they don't get any more people. Who are you from? Oh, I'm, uh, I used to be a Scientologist. I used to have to be a Sea Org member. What's your name? Samantha Domingo. Thank you, Samantha. What's your name? And then we do the naughty stuff, testing the security. <laughs> so if I were to walk on to the church property right now, I would be met with very panicked people, such as the paranoia. When I look back on things um, I believed in the church and things I did, I see a completely different person. I don't know that person. So asking me, you know, how did I feel about the abortion? How did I feel when I was in the Sea Org? I was just a completely different person. I mean, I wasn't a person. The Church of Scientology does not accept any of the complaints or criticisms made in this program. They say that C organization members can and do leave the organization, but stay within the church. They add that Sam Domingo left the Sea Org in 1995 and stayed a member of the church for a further 15 years. They told us that her complaints bear no relation to the church today. They add that the vast majority of Scientologists live ordinary lives and come from all walks of life. They consider that it is abusive to use the word cult to describe any of the religion's beliefs and practices. The Jehovah's Witnesses categorically deny they are a cult. They state, we are Christians who do our best to follow the example of Jesus Christ and live by his teachings and are legally recognized in 152 nations. Their website says that if a family member has been shunned or disfellowshipped, that does not sever the family ties and normal day-to-day -day dealings may continue. Feeling the financial strain at such a young age, we hear from those 12 years old and on benefits this week. Catch that brand new as Britain on benefits season continues tomorrow at 10. Next tonight, the nightmare neighbour next door.